Okay. So, I discussed last time about electromagnetic radiation, which is the basis why we have the different spectroscopic method. Okay. So tonight I'm going to introduce uh, the, the first one, but if you have started watching the recorded videos, okay, so you, you should have an idea about the uh, spectroscopy already, okay? So the simplest one that we have is the so-called absorption spectroscopy. So we could say this uh, absorption spectroscopy, that's the single most common uh, method for quantitative an uh, analysis of molecules. After we could say the balance, the pH meter, the next thing that the lab must have is the so-called spectronic 20. Okay, Spectronic 20 is the simplest uh, spectrophotometer that is being utilized and still exists until now. So as I have told you uh, before, <clears throat> absorption, this is just when the electromagnetic uh, uh, energy is transferred to atoms, ions, molecules in the sample. And usually whenever you uh, illuminate or put energy or light, Okay, into a sample, it results in the transition to higher energy state. And you have learned this as early as uh, Gentium 1. So when light, okay, hit uh, any substance, what it do is it excites, okay, your atom, your ion, or your molecule from the ground state going to the excited state. Okay, and usually the energy required of photon to give this transition is just equals to the difference between the excited state energy level and the ground state energy level. Now the transitions can be in terms of electronics, vibration, rotations, and translation. And the one that we're going to talk about is the one with involving the molecular spectroscopy. Because as you know, there is also atomic spectroscopy, okay? So atomic spectroscopy is what? Three letter word, a uh, three letter. It could be a new atomic spectroscopy if you already watched the video. It could be the AAS or the AES, okay? So what's the difference between the two? Well, this one involves the whole molecule, while this one only involves a certain atom, okay? So if this one involves a certain atom, so that means it, it's just going to analyze all that you can find in the periodic table, the element that you can find in the periodic table, mostly the metals, okay? Now, the term that we need to consider is the so-called power. This is the energy of a beam that reaches a given area per second. And then we have what we call the intensity, the power per unit solid angle. So we could say power and intensity are related to amplitude, okay, or amplitude square. So if we're going to look at the sum of the terms that we use, we have the so-called Beer's law. Is this the first time for you to hear this? No. Okay. So I think as early as 32, you already encountered this one, right? Tama? Yes, for sure. And if we're going to look at Beer's law, this is just equals to what? Absorbance is equals to molar absorptivity times pot length times the concentration. So usually, the, the direct relationship that you really have here is just A and C. Because what can you say about molar absorptivity? It's usually constant, especially for a given molecule. They already know that, okay? 
I, I don't know if you do some clinical tests. Have you noticed when, when they collect what? Uh, your urine or your blood? And what they do is they, they, they try to analyze something from you. So most likely they're using UVBs. Okay. Now, most of the UVBs we could say uh, are absorbance is a non destructive method. So, when you say non destructive method, you can recover your sample. So, the way that you're going to look at here is this one. So, what do you call this beam? What is this beam? Incident light. Huh? And you? Incident. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Binago. So it's an incident beam. And what do you call the one coming up? Look what happened. You have a lot Thanks. of power going in. And then this one, what the, the one goes out. Anong tawag yan? Anong beam? Transmitted po. Transmitted? I... Yeah. Okay. But the, the, the term that they use is usually emergent beam. Okay. Because if you're going to look at what? P over PO, that is equals to what? Anyone? Huh? Transmittance. So that's equals to your transmittance. And I think I have discussed that in your uh, recorded lecture. So here you could see that the amount of light is dependent on the frequency, okay, or wavelength. So uh, how do we put it in terms of uh, what we call the relationship that we have? Parang ganito ata eh. Okay? The amount of light in the form of energy is dependent on the frequency. Or if you're going to look at this, yung isa ganito. So what's the relationship of light with frequency? Is directly Direct proportional. But... How about the amount of light or energy with the wavelength? It is inversely. Inversely. Okay. So uh, this usually uh, you take advantage of this absorbance because if you're going to look at this absorbance, okay, the, the, the higher the concentration, the more intense is the color, the more that it is observed. So usually example that you have here, this is what? Iron 2 plus concentration. So as you're going to look at it, as it becomes more darker or as it's become darker or more dark, okay, there's a higher absorbance in the uh, what we call reading. Okay? And if you're going to look at the relationship between the two, so we could say transmittance is equals to the emergent beam over the incident beam. And we usually measure it in terms of percent transmittance. And if we're going to relate the uh, transmittance to absorbance, this is just what? Lag of T, right? Tama? Or lag over 1T? How do we put it there? The relationship between the two. Anyone? And in relationship to the law, A is just equals to log D. Okay, A is just equals to log of T. Okay, is it log T or negative log T plus? Is it is it? Because it cannot be equals to log t. What, what we could do, if you're going to look like it is what? Log 1 over t, which is just equals to? Tama ba? So either this or this. That is absorbance. Now, if you're going to look at the old model, where in you, uh, old model of the spectrophotometer, where you have analog. So as you could see here, the higher the absorbance, the lower is the transmittance. And if you're going to look at this, 
100% transmittance, zero absorbance. Anong ibig sabihin sa 100% transmittance? Walang light na na absorb. Whatever the uh, incident beam, that is also the emergent beam uh, that come out. Okay? Now, if you're going to what we call absorb all of them, then you can say there's no transmittance. So absorbance is infinite. So usually, what is the ideal absorbance? Sige nga. Is it the higher the absorbance, the better? Or there's an ideal number of your absorbance that you need to maintain? Anyone? Sir, limit ko na po. Pero alam po po, sir, may limit po yun. Kasi kapag na super na po is, dinadilute na lang po siya. Okay. But do you know what's the uh, typical absorbance that you want to do? Anyone? Okay. So someone answered there is 0.1 to 1. Okay. You don't want it to be over 1. Because if it's around 2, so that means it's almost what? If absorbing the light. And sometimes... It already reached what? Saturated level. And you will know later on anong effect niyan doon sa Beer's law. Okay? So if you're going to look at the relationship described in terms of the Beer's law, so you have what? Absorbance. So that's the negative log of percent transmittance divided by 100. Okay? Or negative log T. So the molar absorptivity, it is known. So usually, if if it does, if you don't know it, you're going to get it, okay? Wherein, usually this is what constant. So to to get this one, you run the uh, you, you prepare different concentration and then get the absorbance. And since B is constant, your molar absorptivity is just the what the slope of C versus A, okay? Now, here, law does not hold at high concentration when absorbance is more than one because they tend to what? Become not linear in the previous law. So by measuring the absorbance percent transmit at a given frequency you can get information related to some present with an identified molar absorptivity and wavelength. So there's always a limit on your, what we call beer slow. And as much as possible, you don't want the absorbance to be more than one. And if your sample is fluorescent, you don't want your sample, your, your, your absorbance to be also uh, equals to one. You want it at least one tenth of that, 0.1. Because the difference there is, if the absorbance is high, it's going to fluoresce uh, strongly also. Okay, so let's look at the basic components here. And as you could see, these are just almost the same component that you have in the other method. Okay, so first that you have here is the light source. Okay, so the light source, uh, you can have a continuous light source that emits all wavelength of radiation in the region used, or you can use a specific light source. And an example of specific light source or light source of uh, one wavelength. Anyone? Hmm. Please, sir. Huh? Anyone? You see, Nabi? Ano si Nabi mo? Laser, po. Okay, laser. Laser is what we call monochromatic. But most of the sources are what we call polychromatic. But if you have a laser, there's only one wavelength that you have there. Okay? So if you have a light source, it passes through an entrance slit. Main reason for that is you don't want too much power. So at least the entrance slit will control how much of the light source will go in, okay? In the laser, you don't need that. Usually, that's what you have. You just shoot it straight, sometimes to the sample, okay? 
And then you have what we call the dispersion device. So the dispersion device that you have, that's your, uh, we could say monochromator. And then it will have the exit slit. And then that transit is the sample. And then once you have this, uh, it's a sample, you have what we call a detector. Okay, so that's the common thing that you have. Okay, so this is a Hitachi instrument, UVBs. So if you're going to, this is a laser, uh, a light source that you have there, and then you have a wavelength selector. Okay, so in the wavelength selector, that's where your incident beam, and then once it passes the sample, that should be the length, and then you have the emergent beam, and then you have the so-called detector. That's the basic design that you have. And the desired properties of this component is listed here, light source. You want it to be to create what proper wavelength, and as much as possible, you want a constant power. And this is where the lasers really we could say useful. But the problem with the laser sometimes it becomes so powerful that it can destroy your sample. Okay, and then you want it to be precise. That's why. What do you usually do? If you do uh, UVB's analysis, whether it is a plate reader, whether it is a spectronic 20, ano usually ginagawa nyo if you experience it? You warm up the instrument for some time. You want it to be stable because if you just let's say, okay, rara na tayo, uh, you just turn on the instrument, uh, your lights are might not be stable by that time. So you give at least 10 to 15 minutes of warm up, let it on, and then use it. Okay? You want your light source to be intense so that you have an increase in the power. And if you have an increase in the power, it's easier to see absorbance. Okay? So you want it to be intense, in the higher intensity. Now, in terms of what we call the wavelength selector, you want to have a narrow band pass. Okay, so the narrow band pass allow you to select the desired wavelength. And again, you want at least the light to be a uh, large throughput. And it has something to do with increased power. Why do you need to increase the power, anyone? What happened if it's not powerful? Pass. What happens if your P is not so high? So most likely, the interaction with matter is not good enough. That's the reason why you need it to be a little bit powerful. Okay, So you could see uh, if the power will pass through the sample. Okay. Because what what absorb the incident beam? Anyone? Ano naga absorb sa incident beam? Yung sample po. It's the sample. Now imagine if the incident beam is not powerful enough. So baka pag ano lang doon, sa gitna lang ng sample, hindi na siya nag-emerge. Okay? So that's the reason why you want your uh, thing to be powerful. But sometimes you don't want it to be powerful because it can destroy your sample. Some samples are light sensitive. I experienced it <laughs> person on how some of our sample when, when we put it with laser and instead of using uh, spectra, we use microscope to detect it we can always see some uh, black area in the sample. And what do you think this black area? It's just like the laser hit it and burn it, okay? So that's not too powerful, especially if it's laser. If it's lamp, it's fine. Because the lamp is spread, so you, have, you need a narrow slit and that's the one that will pass through. 
Now, in terms of what we call sample geometry, uh, what we call holder, you want it to be fixed geometry. Ano mangyayari kapag ganito yung cubet mo? Compare it to the one like this. So if you have it like this, you don't have a constant D. Because if you have it like this, sometimes your light might pass here, your light might pass here, so the path length is not the same, right? Does it make sense? So usually, you cubet mo either square or minsan yung test tube. But you have to make sure that the test tube is the light like here, not doon sa baba, kasi may pagka-bend din yun. Okay? So the sample order must transmit the wavelength of interference. And again, you have to uh, have uh, increased power. Now the detector, just like the light source, it should be stable. And most importantly, it is sensitive to the wavelength of the interest. And we're going to discuss each one of them. Although in if you watch the recorded video, I think uh, the chapter that, the, that we have there, I just follow the material that was given to me by uh, ICU PLT. Okay? So, parang sa isang lecture doon, they compare one method, one spectroscopic method with one another. Okay? Now here, we're going to look at the, what we call the light source. So the light source for the UVBs is the one that range from 200 to 800. And most of the light source that you that they use is what we call black body radiators. So when it is a uh, black body radiator, this is where a conducted solid uh, is heated and it will emit electromagnetic radiation. So that's what happened. You have either deuterium or hydrogen. So that's the one that you use in UV range. It is continuous, uh, broad, broadband range of frequency. So this is just based on the excitation of hydrogen or uh, deuterium okay, at low pressure. Okay. So what happened, this is how it looks like. In the presence of the arc, some of the electrical energy is absorbed by deuterium or hydrogen, which results in the disassociation of the gas and release of the light. Okay, so you excite specifically hydrogen or deuterium, and when you excite them, it will release the light. And that light is the one that you use to illuminate your sample. So you just make them into an excited state by letting them add it with some electrical energy. So they absorb the electrical energy. So when they absorb it, okay, there's a release of light. So the excited state uh, form that they have will release the light that is needed. Okay, so the Energy will vary continuously from 160 to 375. So this is the UV region. And this is something to do with the frequency going into D prime to D double prime. So if you're going to look at the intensity, this is the thing. So I'm going 375 long shot. Okay. So you need to make the cell from quartz. So if you're going to use the sample here, it's a quartz cell. Okay. And I think it discussed here, usually anong klase ng cubet material ang ginagamit natin. Anyone? Ano yung tatlong component ng cubet? Or ano yung uh, composition ng cubet natin? Did you watch the video? Mm. So you have the quartz. Ano yung isa? Glass and what's the other one? Salt. Salt is used when you do IR. Okay, 
but if you UV based is plastic. So usually you yung coverage ng quartz from UV hanggang doon. Yung coverage ng glass is at least that one. Yung coverage ng plastic, yung colored. Okay? Now, another thing that they use as what we call source is the so-called tungsten. Filament lump. So it's used for visible to near uh, what we call the region. And this is really what we call based on black body radiation. It's a continuous source and broadband range of frequency. So it hit solid filament to glowing. Light emitted will be characteristic of temperature more than the nature of the filament. So the, the tungsten filament lamp, that's the most common source for visible and near infrared spectrophotometer. Okay. And the tungsten, and later on, kumerong dito halogen lamp, okay, uh, usually they can operate at higher temperature and can be also used as a UV source if you have the tungsten with the halogen. If housed on the quartz, uh, which does not absorb UV light rather than glass, which does. Okay. Now, if you're going to look at the tungsten filament lamp, so the lambda max that you have there is inversely proportional to the temperature. The typical tungsten lamp, 2870K, okay, uh, if you have the tungsten and you, uh, not UV halogen, it can go as high as 3500K. Okay, so the range that you have here is from 350 to 2500, the near IR range. So it needs high temperature to get high intensity light and low lambda max. And tungsten lamp is cheaper, 10 to $15. Okay, so you just follow this so-called black body radiation. Now the other one that you have, it covers both the UV and the BC ball is the so-called xenon arc lamp, okay? It's continuous source, broad range of frequency. The range should be from 250 to 600. So again, we could say it's just like the black body emission, works by passage of current through xenon. Yung tungsten, tungsten, ito xenon. So it causes the thermal excitation. It gives a very intense radiation over the frequency range. It develops for searchlights during the first world war, uh, the second world war. And the problem that you have with this higher heat, more stray light, expensive, and short lifetime. So if you're going to look at the xenon arc lamp profile, so this is where you can apply it. Okay, in the UV ozone tree and the visible region. Trying to more. So that's the light source. Now what's the next one? The wavelength selectors. Ideally, what you want the wavelength selector to be? Class? Ideally, what you want the wavelength selector output to be? Kung siya yung ideal monochromator from the name itself, you want the output to be? Monochrome like na isang ano lang po type ng frequency. Okay. You want it to be just a single wavelength. Ideally. Right? But you know, we live in a real world, right? Pa, pa, parang kaya, di ba? Ideal boyfriend, tall, dark, and handsome, but reality, tall, dark, and never mind. Okay? So the reality that we have, most monochromators are what? Band of wavelengths. Okay? So you want the monochromator to separate the frequencies from polychromatic light and allows only certain wavelengths to be selected and used. 
Okay? So, the narrower the band, the better the wavelength selector and the greater the spectral resolution attainable. So, the narrower the band, the better wavelength selector and the greater spectral resolution. Now, the monochromators can be based on whatever they use. So we have one type of monochromator, which is dispersing monochromator, and it includes what we call the prism. So prism is what? Based on refraction, or what we call gratings. No, 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 not, not grating. It's just refraction. Grating is another form of monochromator. So prism is just based on the refraction of light and fact that different wavelengths have different values of refractive index in a given medium. So this is how the prism. So depending on uh, what we call the medium that you have, okay, it will give you different uh, refractive index in different wavelengths. Okay, so you can look at this, what we call prism, like a dispersion curve. So if ever there is a change in the refractive index, okay, as a function of wavelength. So normally you want to work in areas of normal dispersions for prisms. Now anomalous dispersion usually happen near where the substance itself absorbs the light. So if you're going to look at the refractive index value here. So as you go from lower or shorter to higher wavelength, there is what we call some sort of a changes in the refractive index. Okay, so this is just one material. So look what happened. As the wavelength becomes longer, the refractive in index decreases. Do you see what I mean? Plus, look at the value here. So as it becomes longer, this becomes lower. So yan yung tinatawag na dispersion curve. Have you heard this term before? Hmm? Sa P6 ba? Tinatakal ba to? Parang hindi po, sir. Usually, ano ba P6 nyo? 71, 72, 73? Or ano ba yun? 11, 12, 7, 23 something? 71, 72 po. Oh, 71, 72. Yung, yung agchem, ganun din? Ah, inalis na yung 73. Because sa agchem kasi, parang 11, tsaka 20. Oh, ano mo, itang plain number eh. Alam ko, mas mahirap yung 70, 71 noon eh. So if you're going to look at uh, what we call the, 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 the dispersion the uh, curve, it just relate the index of uh, refraction or refraction index of a given material to the wavelength of light traveling through the material. Okay. Now, we have discussed about the so-called Snell's law, refraction index times sine theta equals to refractive index at different sine. Okay, so no refractions occur if the light at normal is equal to what we call data is equal to zero. So light must hit prism at a certain angle and most common would be the 60% prism, glass or quartz. Okay, so if we have what we call the dispersing 
monochromator. The other one is the grating monochromator. So this is based on diffraction. Okay. So this has the so-called gratings. So the the, the principle uh, the, the principle behind there is what diffraction. Doon sa isa refraction. Okay. So you can have here the so-called transmission gratings. Where the, you have some uh, drops or slits placed on a transparent material, same as the earlier example shown in the diffraction discussion. And here you can look at the order of interference like that. It's just equals to n times wavelength equals to uh, d times sine uh, theta. Okay. So the different wavelengths will have constructive interference at different, uh, at different points. And you can select the desired wavelength by letting light at different points into the instrument. So if you have here the slit, two slits there. So you're going to have the light traveling there. And a different order of interference you're going to get. Okay, some light. So it could be, I don't know if you could see that if you're going to ship, let's say ganon, pag ginanin nyo nito, ito yung makikita nyo. See, that's the D, that's the E, okay? So that's how the relative intensity of the light from the distance in the middle. So parang ano lang to, di ba? Ang tawag dun? Gaussian curve. Okay, so that is the transmission grating. But the one that is common, uh, we use is the so-called reflection grating. So where you have group surface with reflecting coating. So usually it's made up of aluminum, gold, and platinum. Okay. So monochromators yeah, invariably use reflection grating, where closely spaced uh, groups are cut out of a mirror face. So here, the spacing of slits, which is the distance, uh, it's just the distance from one group to next. So typically you have what, 300 to 2,000 groups per millimeter. And what happened here, there's constructive and deconstructive interference that happen because light travels different distances when reflected from each grating. Okay, so the constructive interference can occur when you have this. N times wavelength is equals to the distance times sine of I uh, plus sine of R. What do you think is I? Ano sa tingin yung I? Incident angle po. Okay, so incident angle. Okay, and R is? Reflected ano? angle po. Huh? Reflected angle. Okay, good. Reflected angle. Now, in addition, there is what we call two types of these so-called monochromators, okay? So here you already put those materials that you have here, okay? So the first one that we have is the so-called Cicerny Turner grating. It is one of the useful, uh, we could say, design in monochromator. So if you're going to look at this uh, Cicerny Turner grating, so usually it is partially separates your polychromatic light into a series of monochromatic rays. Okay? So if you're going to look at the light that you have here. So the light will pass through here, right? And then 
there's a mirror, okay, to pass it through that thing. And at a certain angle, it will meet the grating here. So based on the grating, okay, it will uh, deflect. So if you're going to have here, you have an entrance lid and then the collimating lens or mirror, it makes the radiation parallel before hitting the dispersing element. Now your dispersing element here is either a grating or a prism, but here we have a grating as an example. And then what you're going to do is you're going to pass it through, okay, to a focusing lens or mirror. So when that happens, it focus the light of the desired wavelength. And once you get that, it will pass through or go out in the exit slit. And this one goes to your what? Sample. Now, I, I, I have used instrument li like this, usually mga luma. They use the so-called Cicerne grating. Okay? Now, the other one that you have is the so-called Bunsen prism monochromator. Okay? Now, it is, we could say, uh, one of the earliest monochromator that they use, okay? So if you're going to look at this uh, Bunsen burner, uh, Bunsen burner to look, Bunsen prism thing, it, it almost has the same component as your Cicerne Turner monochromator. There's an entrance, entrance lit that you have there, okay? And then you have a collimating lens or mirror. So it makes the radiation parallel before hitting a dispersing element. So there's a slit there. So this is the light source. So it passes through. Okay, the slit. So there's the lens that you have. Okay, and then it passes through what we call the prism. So instead of the gratings, you have here a prism. And then into the prism, it will what? Separate into different color. And then the focusing lens will get, then uh, will focus more on the color that you have there. And then once you have it here, okay, that's where you're going to make the source exit, okay? So the focusing lens or the mirror that you have there, that will focus light like of the desired wavelength on exit slit, okay? So if you're going to compare the two material, uh, if you have a grating, we could say it's a uniform dispersion versus the wavelength. It has a smaller size. Uh, the problem is it has a higher stray light. And the wavelength region use is unlimited. Now, prism, on the other hand, it, show, it has a shorter wavelength, but it's better separated. It is larger size. Stray light is not a problem. Okay, but the problem is the, 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 the range that you use is limited. So usually less than. 350 nanometer. Now, how do you uh, improve uh, better dispersion? You increase the size of either the tube, the prism or the grating. And then to solve the, the problem of stray light, you're going to use this, what we call filters. The, the principle of the filters is the same as when you use sun, uh, uh, what do you call that? The shades or sunglass, okay, to remove the UV rays coming from the sun. Now, always remember that glass absorbs light at wavelength less than 350. Yeah, you can use uh, some sort of a polarizer also here, but the polarizer is doing other things. I guess it was a filter. The difference doing the concept no dalawa. Okay. Y yung filter kasi parang kinakat lang niya. So pag ano dito, hindi, hindi mo siya maano. They, they, they work in a similar way, but the difference is something to do that they selectively 
let light waves of a certain polarization. Y yung polarizer, if I'm not mistaken, uh, binablock niya yung light na reflect of a surface. Pero yung filter, kinakat off niya. So kapag may filter ka, 350 cut off. So anything that is less than 350, okay, hindi uh, i-prevent niya na pumasok doon sa material. Th th that's the what we call concept that we have there. Because uh, when, when we do laser, so sometimes we don't want some stray uh, laser to hit our eyes. So usually we use a, a, a filter that cut off kung ano man yung wavelength ng laser na ginagamit namin. Yes, I use laser. Okay. <laughs> I, try, I have a photo of that in the Facebook. If ever you, you want uh, proof kung gumamit niya ako ng laser. And it's not easy to use laser because if you are not careful, if it hit your eyes, okay, sana, ano tawag din, lasik ba yun? But kapag too powerful, uh, it can damage your eyes. <laughs> That's the what we call the problem with, with, with the uh, use of laser. And laser usually they're powerful. Masyado mataas yung power niya. <clears throat> Nasa na tayo. Slits. So what what is this slits in the monochromator? Okay. Sometimes you're asked to use what we call a certain size of what we call slits. So usually uh, the purpose of these slits is to control the size okay? and position of the beam of light passing through the slit. And sometimes you have how many slit? Dalawa. Ano yung dalawang slit? Anyone? You have the entrance slit and the exit slit. Okay? So, slits in the monochromator, you need to carefully made since they control the range of the wavelength emerging. Uh, from the monochromator. So typical slit widths are 0 0.01 to 2 millimeter. They're open adjustable. So if you have this band pass of the monochromator, that's the range of the wavelength transmitted at half height of the transmitted light. So if you're going to look at here, so usually the typical band pass that you have is around 20 to 0.5 nanometer for you with this instrument. Okay? So you want the slit side to decrease so that the band pass is also decreased. But if that happens, okay, you have the less undesired wavelengths and also, unfortunately, less intensity. Try to imagine it. Let's say you are in the dark room. So, pag Maliit lang yung opening, hindi malakas yung intensity ng light. Pag nilakihan mo yung opening, malakas yung intensity niya. But the problem, kapag malakas na intensity niya, okay, yung band pass niya, okay, masyado nang malaki yung region. So you want this at least here. So let's say this is your target. Okay, what happens is you, depending on the slit, size so either you can make it wider or narrower okay because you want the center you you want that that, that that's the uh wavelength that you want okay so you can also have two wavelengths 
that can be resolved by the monochromator if they differ by two or more times the band pass. So usually the wavelength resolution is directly related to the slip size. Now we also have here the different types of what we call filter, okay? In monochromators, the filters usually can be absorption filters. So material remove the undesired wavelengths by absorbing them. So ito yung sinasabi ko sa inyo, pag ginamit nyo yun, ka-cut off niya. Kung ano man yung wavelength na pwede niya i-cut off. So typically made from colored glass or dye suspended in gelatin between glass panes. So it is a fixed wavelength, much energy loss due to absorption. It's cheap. Okay, it, you can have a wide range of uh, wavelength that's allowed to pass through, or you can combine the filters with different wavelength range. Typical band pass would be around 30 to 250 nanometers. So if you have an absorption filter, so ito yung mga nagagamit mo yung green filter, orange cut of filter, and the combination of two filters. Okay? So if you're going to use it at a certain wavelength, so for here, kaya niyang i-cut off yung filter na yan. Usually yung kinakat of mong ano, eh, wavelength is lower. Why? Bakit kaya lower wavelength or shorter wavelength yung kinakat of mo? Anyone? Because they are the one that is higher energetic. Okay. Now you can also have this so called interference filter. So these are made up of thin layers of metal and dielectric, like calcium chloride, sandwich, uh, metal material sandwiched between the glass plates. So you have a glass, a metal, then the dielectric metal glass. So if there's the broadband light source. So if it pass through it, you can make the wavelength narrower. Okay. So the, me the, the, the metal that act like a mirror. You kita nyo na yung metal, di ba? Sometimes it reflects. <laughs> so as light enters, same go some goes through, but some is reflected. So yung inaano no mirror, yung reflect niya. So the, the distance the light travels before it exists generates constructive and destructive interference on the other side of the filter. So the wavelength is transmitted through the filter. Okay. So integer times wavelength equals to two times the thickness of dielectric times refractive index. So the bandpass can be one to 20 na nanometer. Okay. But the filter is fixed at the given value as much intensity is lost due to reflection. Next one, sample cell. Should be transparent. At least a UV piece. Okay, if it's an IR, there are instances that it's okay to be uh, what we call not transparent. Sometimes ang itim-itim na nung glass window na ginagamit namin, but we still see it because there's a laser that passed through it. Okay? So you have quartz or fused silica for UV, or you can have glass or plastic for visible region. So best if you have flat cells with much samples and reference cells. Many are automated instrument have uh, flow so uh, flow through cells with temperature control. It's usually like ganyan. Hindi lahat ng ano square. Meron ako nakita na parang ganito. So sa tingin niyo saan saan daadaan yung light? If you have a cubet like this. That way. Okay? Now the other component that we have here is the detectors. So the detectors, the detectors that we have is our eye, right? So the areas detectors were the eye or what we call the film. Now they have devices that convert the light to electrical signal. Okay. 
So before, they use the human eyes that, oh, this is darker, but you know, you can make it more, you can have a, a more sensitive instrument than the eye. Because eye, when there's strain, can give you bias, uh, what we call images. Okay. So the, the way that we're going, uh, you, you have here is they were able to develop a detector that is more sensitive than the eye. Because one uh, requirement of a good detector is high sensitivity. Okay. Why? What happens if your detector is high sensitivity? Anyone? You can measure a small amount of substances. Okay. And if you have high sensitivity, usually you have a good signal to noise ratio. Uh, another thing that you need for a good detector is the constant response over the wave, wavelength range of interest. And you want the signal to be proportional to light intensity. So the stronger is the light intensity, the higher is the signal. You want the response to be fast and as much as possible, little or, little or no signals in the absence of light or the so-called dark current. Are you familiar with dark current? So usually the dark current, that, that it has something to do with thermal generators or thermal electrons that are generated. So uh, uh, as much as possible, you don't want your detector to be uh, what we call affected, okay? Little or no signals in the absence of what we call light. So if there's no light, you want it to be what? no signal because dark current they, they don't depend on the light they, they, they depend usually on the what we call thermal electrons although light is one source of electrons okay to be excited but there are other sources we have that's why you call it dark current okay when light is not the source for the uh, what we call thermal electrons now, there are many types of the available uh, detectors for UVBs. So one that we have here is the so-called photovoltaic cell, the barrier layer cell. Okay, so the process that you have here, uh, or the mechanism, light of sufficiently high energy passes through a thin, thin transparent silver layer. So that's one, so the light will, pa will pass through that thing there, okay. And it hits the selenium, causing electrons to be relieved, which move across the barrier toward the silver layer, which is electropositive, and collected that iron layer to neutralize the selenium layer. Okay, so the current produced is proportional to the photons hitting the surface. So I think this is an application of the photoelectric effect. So the maximum response at 500 nanometer. Okay. Now the advantage of this chip, bracket, no external power source and good for portable instrument. Now the disadvantage is not as sensitive and it shows fatigue. So the, the, the decrease in response with continuous use or illumination and difficult to amplify small signal, uh, signal small resistance. Now, the other one that they use, the vacuum phototube. Okay. So here you have a photo emission material. Uh, cesium oxide uh, ejects when electron, uh, uh, when ejects an electron when hit with a photon. So this is a photoelectric effect uh, application. Okay, so the potential of 90 volts across the cathode and anode. So as the light hits the cathode, the electron can are emitted from the cathode and attracted to the anode. So it produces a current that can be measured. 
So we could say the current is proportional to the electrodes that was ejected. Huh? So current is proportional to the number of photons. So the smaller the current, then voltaic cell, but it can be amplified because of the larger resistance. And 90 volts is enough to collect all the electrons that is produced. Now, if you're going to look at this, uh, what we call vacuum photo tube, okay? So its sensitivity usually, uh, anong masasabi natin dito? Different at certain wavelength, okay? So the way that they use is to use multi-photo tubes because one photo tube sensitive on this wavelength, one on this one, and the other one on this one. So one tube for UV and another tube for visible region. Some photo tube, they have flat region throughout the entire area, like the uh, 128 gallium arsenic composite. Sometimes gas is present in the tube and as electrons collide with gas, more electrons and ions produce results in an increase in current. It is sensitive and the signal is easily amplified. The disadvantage is you might have some dark current there, the presence of the dark current because of the thermal electrons. Now, the one that is commonly found, I don't know if you could see the movie here. This is what we call the photomultiplier tube. This is what we call the PMT. This is memorable for the for me because I tried one of the PMT with the laser. <laughs> because it was my first time using it, and the one teaching me didn't told me that I have to close the slit. So what happened? So the slit is open, so the laser was, was turned on, so it straight goes to the detector. Ayun, right, sira. <laughs> so if you're going to look at the photon multipliers, if you're going to look at the uh, movie here, so you see the yellow light that passes through, so the light hits the cathode. Ayun natin ulit. Ayun na mag-play. <laughs> that. So light hits the cathode and electrons are emitted. Kita niyo yun, yung photocathode. Tapos yung emitted electrode na yun, attracted to electrode, dynode 1, which is 90 volts more positive causes several more electrodes to emitted. So photon multiplied yung nangyayari. Okay? And what happened is, when all of them are done, so when, 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 sayang. So when it hit already the ninth there, okay, the current is already uh, amplified and measured. You have a lot of photons uh, that produce a lot of electrons. Okay, it is very sensitive uh, to low intensity and very fast response. The disadvantage is you need a high voltage power supplies and intense light damages. Okay, coming from my experience. So if you're using laser, be careful. You just realize, why don't we do get any reading? Yung pala, wala na yung uh, detector namin. Nasira na. <laughs> and then we have the photodiode detector, or this, uh, usually the silicon diode. So here, uh, you have a semiconductor metal usually silicon, that conducts current only under certain conditions. So having the semiconductor, so meron tayong positive and negative uh, junction that we have there. Okay, so the free electrons inside the n-type material need some extra energy to overcome the repulsion of the p-type acceptor atom. So you have a light shining on the silicon diode. It provides the energy needed for the electrons to travel into the p region. And the flow of current is related to intensity of the light. Now, the, the, the good thing with these uh, semiconductor detectors, 
it allows you to, to build okay, a multi-channel instrument. Not very sensitive, but useful in uh, Bitcoin tubes. And Bitcoin tubes can be used for one and two dimensional detection. So it can detect all the wavelengths along the focal plane of an instrument. Okay. So a Bitcoin tube was shown here. It contains many silicon diodes, each insulated from each other. And the electron gun or light source sweeps the free region and charges the diodes. So let's go with the single and the double beam instrument. So if I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure if the single beam and the double beam UBBs that we have there in UPLB is still functional. It was already there during my time, so God forbid kung bumigay yun, but I hope you have new instrument there. Okay? So usually, both of them determine absorber, both the incident uh, beam and the emergent beam that is measured. And we could say the absorbance that you have there, it depends on the intensity of the source, the slip width and the wavelength of the monochromator, the reflectance of the cell, and the sensitivity of the detector. So all of them contribute to the absorbance one way or another. Okay. Higher intensity, we could say higher absorbance. So that means you lower the concentration that you have. So if you lower the concentration that you have, you increase the sensitivity. Slip width, okay. Uh, Narrower, much better compared to the wider one. Narrower, that means the region of the wavelength is narrow. Now, if the slit width is bigger, so most likely there's a much bigger one. So, um, effect lang nito is has something to do with the intensity. Okay, the narrower one, less intense compared to the wider one. And then reflectance of the cell, that's why you want it to be transparent, and then you want the detector to be sensitive. So this is a spectronic 20. May nakita ba kayo niyan sa lab, dyan, doon sa mga in-person? Ba? May nakita ba kayo? Siguro naman may instrument dyan, no? Ano? Anong instrument na nagamit nyo? Sige nga. Na full online pa rin. Eh, yung mga in-person na. Kahit yung higher lab, online pa rin. Pero next year daw, sabi, uh, next school year, sabi ng chat, bawal na daw yung in-person, di ba? I mean yung online. Kaya hindi na ako magtuturo. <laughs> Kayo na yung ano, last batch ng undergrad. Baka grad, stud, stud, grad courses na naturuan ko. <laughs> so, you, you have not seen it. So, this is how it is. I know it's still there. If I'm not mistaken, yung first experiment nyo sa 137.1 is Spectronic 20. Ilalagay nyo yung chalk doon. I'm not sure if still that the one. Because I used to teach uh, 137.1 before. Okay. So the incident beam is measured with solvent on the cell. So what, what, what you do here is, uh, parang siya yung blank. 
Okay, so the emergent being blank, everything except compound to be analyzed. So the spectrometer is adjusted to read 100% uh, transmission or zero absorbance. So usually, may nab kang uh, uh, ano dyan, ha, uh, uh, pag nilagay mo yung blank mo, I just used it last week in an experiment. So if you put your, your, your test tube here with blank, so may, uh, may uh, adjust kang nab to make it zero. The absorbance. And then, ilalagay mo yung sample mo. Okay? So, zero transmittance or uh, infinite, uh, zero transmittance or infinite absorbance is set by blocking the light beam. So, settings may change over a period of minutes. There's always a trip. Change in the light source intensity. So, usually what you do, you always block use a blank and then sample and then blank and then sample because means like drip okay so the settings are wavelength de uh, dependent so this is just a monochromatic so it's a wavelength at a time so if you're going to look at the uh block diagram so this is your light source it passed through the lens okay and then uh, entrance list that was meron ka pang focusing lens the uh, objective lens here Gaano sa creating okay? and then what happened it passed through some focusing lens until it gets out on the exit uh, exit slit so you can see major circle yung ano dito because test tube yung ginagamit and then you pass the filter that's where the photo tube is all lab usually has that because that's the simplest spectrometer kung wala kayo niyan ibig sabihin ang yaman niyo I told you all love, even our love here, because I used that last week. Okay. So the single wing spectrometer is around 340 to 625. Uh, other photo goes with 950 nanometer with 20 nanometer band. So the reference photo tube electronically adjusts the changes in the source intensity and the wavelength control turns the grating. So pag tinern mo yung wavelength control. Uh, yung kung anong wavelength yung ano mo, gratings lang ang nagpapaturn doon. Okay? So, if you adjust it in 0% transmittance, it sets the meter to 0% when the occluder blocks the light beam. At 100% transmittance, you adjust it to a B-shaped slot or out of the light beam so the meter reads at 100 of store band. Advantage of this chip, rugged, Disadvantage, you have to readjust 100% transmittance at every wavelength. So pag palit mo, isisiro uli mo siya yung absorbance. Okay? And you have to check it for drip. So ang ginagawa ko na lang, every time mag-read yung mga student ko, I told them to put the blank and then put the sample. Now we also have a double beam spectrometer there okay it decreased the uh what we or eliminate the single beam problems so here you can use both the deuterium lamp and the tungsten lamp so this is a schematic of the hitachi Sorry for that. So, if you have a double beam spectrometer, ang ano dito, dalawang qubit yung gagamitin mo. One that contains the reference and the other one that contains the sample. Now, most of the uh, modern UVBs has it. Pero ang ginagawa namin, uh, we just use the sample side. So, pag kinukuha namin yung baseline, wala na kami nilalagay doon sa reference para yung baseline ay kung ano yun nandoon sa sample qubit. Okay? Kasi nangyari kasi dito, so yung light, so pag gandaan sa sa grating, so pag ano nung dito sa mirror, so pareho yung titignan yung uh, reading doon sa sample tsaka doon sa reference. But if you set, okay, that 
in the sample, you have the blank and in the reference, you don't have anything. So automatic na siya mag adjust doon sa uh, blank reading. So kung nilagay mo yung sample mo, okay, uh, maririd na niya yung difference because you already set the blank using the solvent. Okay? So, selector, mirror, or beam chopper, ito yun, which rotate at 60 counts per second, reflecting the light alternatively to the reference and the sample cell. So, all light is combined and goes to a single photomultiplier tube, and the output of photomultiplier tube is 60 counts per a second square wave. So, the <clears throat> Incident beam and emergent beam are measured alternatively at a rate of 60 times per second. So the advantage of this, uh, you can scan for the wavelength. Okay, little drip and you only use one PMT. The disadvantage, a little bit complicated and expensive. Okay, so that's uh, what I'm going to tackle uh, today, but I want you to, to make sure, so if we're going to look at, the part that we need to discuss, so at least, tapos na tayo sa absorbance, right? Okay. Now, the next one that you have, so, meron tayong molecular, meron din tayong atomic spectroscopy. Tapos, in addition to that, meron tayong tinatawag na emission. Because if you're going to look at what really is happening, Right? So, so usually, if you're going to look at this, you have what? The light source. And then what happened to the light source? Okay? So you, you put an incident light on it. So, anong pwede mangyari kapag meron kang sample na nasa qubit? Ano yung nangyari ngayon? So, may pag ano dyan, may lumabas. Yan yung absorbance. Now, what if you do it like this? Tinignan mo siya. At this angle, anong tawag doon? Plus. <laughs> so this one is the common absorbance. But what if 90 degree angle mo siya minometer? Anong tawag doon? Hmm? So usually absorbance, parang pass through. But if it's a 90 degree angle, that is what we call emission. So usually, dyan pumapasok yung luminescence. Okay? Now in the luminescence, pwede dyan yung phosphorescence at fluorescence. Now, if you're asked, which do you think is more sensitive? Fluorescence or absorbance? Anyone? Ito yung mga tanong na pang for the exam. Fluorescence po. Fluorescence. But you have to take into consideration not all samples fluoresce. Okay. 
Now, another thing that you have this aside from is the atomic absorption or atomic emission spectroscopy. So what is usually the sample that you analyze in AAS? Anyone? Ano yung sample na ina-analyze nyo usually sa AAS? They are what? Is it large molecule? The large molecule you use here, absorbance or fluorescence. Ano usually ang minimeasure nyo sa protein? Anong, anong amino acids ng protein ang minimeasure nyo for fluorescence? Anyone? So usually you look at this so-called uh, aromatic ring. Okay, you can use it for absorbance and some of them you can use for fluorescence. Now for AAS, usually you use it for metals. So what, what I want you to do is to watch the videos, okay? Uh, all the videos that we have, and then we can meet on Wednesday next week. And then I, I will give you some uh, quiz, some version on Thursday, uh, on Friday. We will not be able to meet on Friday because I'm out of town. And I don't know if you know the event called here Thanksgiving. <laughs> So I will be out of town. So I'm not, we're not going to meet next uh, Friday. But you will have some stuff to do. Okay. So holiday kasi next week. But we're still going to meet on uh, what we call Wednesday. But before we meet on that day, I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I'm not going to give any quiz or assignment. But I want you to watch all the video. Hindi ko may bibigay yung ano ngayon problem set because right now it's just I don't know I have I just finished an, an exam and then tomorrow I have an exam there in 18 and then on Saturday I have an, another exam and then on Monday I have another exam so I'm preparing a lot of exam so hindi ko na prepare yung ano niyo but just wait maybe I just going to look for some problem cut and paste and send it to you <laughs> and then the thing that I want you to do from now until we meet again on Wednesday is to look at the videos of spectroscopy so that we can wrap it up by next week because it's December na, and we still have mass spec and uh, what we call electrochemistry to cover. <laughs> So, uh, wala bang extension yung semester? Kaya at di ano, gahol tayo sa oras. Okay? Para kayo mga estudyante ko. We want the exam to be on before December 22 because it's already expensive way beyond that to book a ticket. <laughs> so ganun na lang. Uh, I'm going to let you know in the group chat kung meron kayong assignment by the weekend. If ever problem solving lang yun similar doon sa what we call Chromatography. That's why I have beside me this one.
na this one, the, the Bible of your course. Okay? So, question. Yeah, we decided to divide the quizzes instead of one long exam. Ano bang gusto niyo? One long exam or divide? Ano lang problema sa akin? One long exam for one chapter if you want. Okay, sa chap-chapin pa konti-konti, gaya ng ginawa natin sa chromatography. So, ano gusto niyo sa module 4? Isang buong exam na lang? Hmm? What do you want? Maybe give me the answer on Wednesday. If you want one big exam or chop chop. Okay? Kayo, mag-poll kayo and let me know. Well, it will be uh I don't know, next week or in two weeks. We can decide, okay? But kung ayaw nyo yung pa-chop-chop, gusto nyo lang one, one, one big exam for module, I have no problem on that, okay? Kasi chinap-chop ko because I think one long exam in chromatography, I think is too much. So, kung time consuming yun, then we're going to have one big exam. Tapos. Okay? So, question? Because it's almost uh, one o'clock there. 